All righty. So uh, thanks for sharing, Pierre. Uh, Sarah, great to see you. This is your first collab. Thank you for joining us. Um, please tell us, uh, share with the group exciting things happening in your world. Yeah, so thanks for the invite. I'll just introduce myself, Sarah Palud, um, immigration attorney for 17 years now. And I recently, just a month ago, started my own firm. So I'm solo now. I use Visa AI, so embarking on that. Um, what's exciting is I actually, <laughs> this morning, just filed my first complaint in federal district court. Um, I don't usually litigate, so I'm usually on the petition side, but really excited about, about that. Um, yeah, and that the weather's finally nice. I'm actually in Montreal, Canada, so we had a nice storm a week ago, and today oh. it's 70 degrees, so loving that. Looking forward to the weekend. That's great. I can't imagine. I was so over the cold, so I bet you're, you're excited to have some sun, just like us. That's awesome. Um, yes, thank you for joining us as well. We'd love to hear from you. What's exciting in your world? Okay, good morning, guys. Um, my name is Yash Rasamsetti. I am um, an associate uh, at Lily Law, um, practicing immigration. I do have a background in tax, so I do both. Um, I'm excited that we're finally having great weather. <laughs> um, ever since I moved to Oklahoma, it's been quite chilly. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, it's starting to feel like Florida weather again a little bit, so I'm excited um, for the next few weeks before the tornadoes come, so. Thanks, Yesh. Hopefully we won't have any more since we already got hit with one this year. One to know for the year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great, thanks for sharing. Joy, welcome back. Happy to see your face again here on the collab with us. What's exciting in your world? Um, so as most of you know, Sarah, you don't, um, I actually manage mobility for a multinational organization and one of my key roles is managing our immigration services. But what's exciting in my world is we just completed, I just completed the judging for the Forum of Expatriate Management's upcoming EMMA Awards and we'll be heading to Texas at the beginning of May to actually attend that. So really excited about that. Only happens once a year and pick the best and brightest of companies and individuals throughout the mobility space. So. Wow, that sounds really awesome. That's yes. I'd love to go to that. That's so cool. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. All right, John, last but not least, welcome to our collab. Thanks for joining yeah. us as well. <laughs> hey, it's please share here. what's exciting in your world. Yeah, well, I've got a pretty view right here. You can see it. There's a Koi Tower of San Francisco in the Bay over there. And uh, oh, it's, 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 like like this place a lot. And uh, today we'll be uh, uh, at the IT Serve Startup Expo, um, both talking about visas.ai and, and talking to other entrepreneurs about their immigration uh, pathways. So it uh, should be a lot of fun uh, from that. Uh, Joy, is uh, what you're doing part of the relocation um, association down there? I think there's a North Texas relocation uh, association. I've been to some of their meetings. Yeah, so um, pretty much every state and region has a mm -hmm. relocation council. And, yeah. But this actually happens to be the form of expatriate management. It's actually a global organization and it okay. happens um, each year they do the expatriate management awards. And so the oh. America's version is actually in Dallas. No in May. So, no. yeah, so I've been fortunate um, the last couple of years I've been a judge. So I get to see what other companies are doing and I rate them based off of their innovation and creativity and everything. Mm, you probably neat. didn't know that. I, I don't think I've mentioned that before. No, no. That's I know, I didn't. That's you, so can cool. get a, you can get an EB1 visa as judge of the work of others, at least one of those criteria. <laughs> that was my exact thought. <laughs> You know, and the funny thing is, when we were talking about the EVs on one of the other collabs, I was actually thinking that. I was like, well, I judge the work of others, and, you know, and it's a selective group as well. So, yeah. you know, it's like, no, that's you. Would <laughs> definitely would have gotten that criteria. So that's that's fantastic. I see uh, we have Sarah on, on the call today. Hi, Sarah. Hi, John. Sorry, I unmuted myself. Yeah, how are you? How are things going in uh, in your world? 
Um, pretty good. Yeah, pretty Excellent. good. And I'm I'm just starting up um in the solo practice area. So really excited mm. about that's neat. Um, it's it's uh, you know as we're as we're heating, we're we're doing our first wave of of H one Bs, and uh, uh, it, it's it's interesting. We didn't do many in April last year. You know, this whole thing of the of the uh, the registration is is recent. Um, Come back later, please. Yeah, is is recent, um, and so each year has its own wrinkles. And last year we saw very like none in April a few in May and then a flood in June. So of course that was hard. And so we've tried to get our clients to get their stuff together. And as you know, um, in the staffing company world, it's not as, it's not as easy as, as some of the others that are just hiring people to work directly on their projects because they may not know what the projects are yet. Um, there's so many people that applied for the H1B once they got picked up, they may have been picked up between two or three different companies and then they're negotiating. Right. So um, an interesting an interesting thing. But we're seeing we're seeing them come on board faster this year than we did last year. That's our our anecdote. What are, what are you seeing around that? Well, now that I've moved out of in-house practice for a staffing yeah. firm. Yes, I don't actually. um None of my cap cases were selected. <laughs> oh no! Oh, I'm sorry. That that is one of the saddest parts of this situation. And and one of the things that we can talk about a little bit are who got picked and who didn't get picked, and what that means. Because you know, we had one client, a uh, really good client. They put in 20 registrations, and they got zero. We had other clients. Uh, let me use the other end of the spectrum. We got contacted. Yes, yes, uh, um, introduced us to these guys, I think, or we met them through. Um, uh, we did a we did a uh, uh, a video sort of thing with a group called Melody Mocktail, um, and and so a, a, a call that came out of the Melody Mocktail was uh, a gentleman that said, "I've got eighteen H one Bs. I have three companies." We're like, "Oh, cool! This is what a great client, right?" And it was like, "Okay, so where is your office?" Uh, I don't have an office. Um, how many employees do you have? Well, I don't have any employees. When, when did you found your find your company? February. Um, where are you, sir? Well, I'm in India. I'm like, so or like, you're not going to get any of these approved. I mean, there's like no way. He's like, John, just take care of it. I'm like, well, what do you what do you mean take care of it? How, how do I take care of that? Right. So what a shame that there are people that that have um, you know real work ready to go and others. And I think what we, what I saw, and, and I'm not sure this gentleman did it, but that people actually went out and recruited people like, we'll do your immigration case for you. And I think there might be some instances as we, as we learn more about this, where they charge people, you know, Hey, I file your case. It'll cost you X. And, you know, I've seen websites where they actually have a category that says immigration. Right. So, um, weird, weird world. And, and the irony is I think immigration is going to punish these people for this, but it's like not solving the real problem. The real problem is why do we have a cap, right? If we have a, a demand for tech workers or all workers in America and companies that want to hire them, why did we come up with an arbitrary number? Why don't we raise the arbitrary number or why don't we just let the market demand it? Right. I mean, so the funny thing is we'll, we'll quibble over whether somebody was genuine or disingenuine and how they, uh, you know, went into the lottery, but it's really not even the issue. Right. And that, and that, so I'm really sorry to hear your clients didn't get any picked up. Um, there will be other clients that have people and they could work into a vendor role possibly as long as the, the company, unlike these guys we talked to have a real company, right. They could then, as, as you know, uh, subcontract their employees to your your workers possibly, and if, if Sarah, if you if any of your guys need that, um, we we find out kind of as we go into this, folks that have too many and those that don't have enough, and we just do email intros. Um, so we're glad to pass any of that along if your if your folks need that. Mm -hmm. um, Joy, you have your hand raised. I do. So of course, working in house to an MNC. Uh, when we submit these applications, of course, it's because we have a, a, a job for somebody that we need to have feel, filled immediately. So we actually only submitted one this year. It did get selected. But literally a week and a half after they closed it, I get right. a request from the business that they have a new hire that they want me to hire into the United States. And I'm like, 
I can't. There is literally no immigration process available to hire this employee into the United States for the role that he's going to work for. So I literally had to sit down with the business and say, you should have come to me a month ago when you were interviewing the guy. So I could at least get him in the cap drawing and then have to find out where am I going to put him for the next year until I can actually do an L or an H1B later. Like seriously people. But the fact that we have no access to anything other than, you know, the, um, the internal transfers, it makes it really difficult. I mean, I can't do O visas. It doesn't qualify in the field that right. we're in. So right. very disappointing. Tried in E, but you know, wrong nationality. They haven't signed the Irish um, agreement yet for E threes yet. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> but you they know, could join the own company as an E two, right? Say that again. They could, I guess they could open their own company as an E2. <laughs> Not in the role. Not the um, type of role that they're going to be performing. Right. Oh, right. They, they would have yeah. to be owners of a company, right? Which then exactly. kills the whole employee-employee relationship. One, exactly. of the, one of the things, and I don't know, you'd have to look at, at it for the legitimacy of it, right? But for the, um, uh, for the, um, Theoretically, it works, right? So theoretically, a cap-based company can be can file a concurrent um, visa for um, an H one B who's on um, is capped exempt, right? So if you're working at a university or another capped exempt type of entity, you could also work for the for profit, right? So maybe Joy or Sarah, this could be helpful for you. So then you'd have to find somebody that would want to do that. So you know, I guess uh, necessity being the mother of invention, I saw some ads for an entity um, that was uh, saying, we will file for uh, cap exempt H-1Bs and then uh, for your people you're interested in and they could work for you also and we can talk about ours. And I think pursuant to the law, um, and I'd probably have to look at this closer that, that the cap exempt can have less hours than the cap based in that concurrent scenario. But, you know, it would be a smell test. And what we've noticed with immigration is uh, they hate numbers. So one or two might be OK. But if we see a flood of this, um, you know, tens of thousands of people utilizing one company to be their concurrent H-1B, I, I can just imagine the RFE on that. Right. But um, if if you're interested in that, uh, either one of you guys, um, I, I could probably look up who that organization was. I don't know them. I didn't have a conversation with them, but, uh, uh, but they, they promised that they'd had a hundred percent approval and they've been doing it for a while. And it just seems like they're, they're trying to fill a niche. What, what do you guys think theoretically, uh, both uh, you joy first and Sarah about um, sharing um, an employee with a cap exempt? Does that, does that not so- pass the, test or is what do you what do you think about it in general so i can tell you given the nature of the industry that we're in Mm. and how highly regulated it is yeah um we follow things by the book literally um Mm. you know we're we're in the spirits industry you know we don't want to mess around with atf or you know Mm. non-compliance so yeah so i don't think it is something that we would do but we do always look at alternative options. Like at the moment, I'm looking at, you know, immigration in Panama and Mexico for the individual. And we'll yeah. Probably, yeah, we'll probably keep them in Panama or Mexico, you know, until he meets the inter, uh, um, inter, uh, intercompany transfer rules. That's a neat. That's a neat strategy. That the near shore, as they call that. Um, well, and that that's what we. I think we talked last week about it. About the guy in Canada saying, "I can set up um, your employee in Canada, um, and and they can get a visa here, and then work for you in the U.S." And you would you'd so wisely said, "Do you know what the tax implications are?" And of course, we all exactly. said no. <laughs> and then you said, "Well, they're big." So that's interesting. Uh, Sarah, what do you think about either of those two options um, from whatever sense that it that it strikes you as an option? <clears throat> yeah, so I think the part-time 
CAP exempt uh, is an option. I've actually spoken with that organization and I, oh. I did go through oh. that. It's really going to depend on how much the client wants that particular individual, right? Because it's not cheap and they end up working five to 10 hours, um, you know, in, with this other organization. So you're sharing the, the time of that employee as well. So I think there's very few, at least at what I've come across, my clients, most of the time, once they see the cost involved, they pass. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's very costly. It does work sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I actually, I, I, I'm actually a, a, a more of a fan of the business model of what I'm hearing than what I thought it could have been. Right. Uh, the fact that they're saying you got to do at least five or 10 hours makes yeah. it legitimate. Right. And you can, you know, if they said, Hey, they can work one hour a week or whatever, I could just see trying to defend that in an RFE. Uh, and as a business model, if that was my client, that was the, uh, the holder of, of those visas. So they have to have that. Right. So that means, the, the the employer is now down to 30 to 35 and then as as in the staffing world where it's all margin anyway um there's that and uh how do you you know what what's the lca gonna say i mean right. you know where's this guy gonna work is he is he have they already have that visa they and then you're concurrently doing it and you're working at a third party location while you have an LCA in another place, which would obviously have to be a different place, right? There's so there's a there's a lot of headaches there, but I didn't think about the cost, although I can imagine there would have to be a cost and it would have to be significant, or why else would they do this, right? So thank you for that insight. Uh, and interesting that you went down that path. Uh Joy, you have a you have your hand up. Yeah, I was actually, when I was walking through this um, this opportunity um, for the business, one of the things that I actually took into consideration was, you know, doing a green card application for an H-1B is actually a lot more challenging than doing a green card application for a multinational manager. And so when we actually laid out the strategy for this particular individual, I was like, you know, you're actually setting the employee up for a better opportunity by waiting a year to bring them into the United States, because at least we can set them up as, I mean, it's a director level to begin with. So you're setting them up as a multinational manager and then bringing them in under an L1A, at least mm -hmm. it opens it up to an easier process for the green card application. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I, we've had these conversations this week too, right? So this is this will segue a little bit. This and Ben, I know you want to jump in, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll go to you in a second. Um, but uh, so we had a, a law firm in San Francisco that applied for three H one Bs, and um, all three were uh, declined or didn't get picked up. So we talked about the possibilities, and we looked at the J. And there's a really cool program for lawyers on a J one, right? I did one once for a New Zealand lawyer named Azania who came over, and we basically built a 18 month pl uh, plan where she learned all the different types of visas, and she could go back to New Zealand and then do you know know how to uh, operate a, an immigration law firm to for america right i mean it, it, we we see those all the time with people in other countries that are providing the services that we provide there right because what we have is somebody from another country and a company here so you know it's an interesting model and it made sense and we we passed it it was quite easy uh the, to to be uh, a, a j1 program company they actually come out for a site visit it literally uh was nothing the guy flew in took a cab shook my hand turned around and walked and said we just need to see that something exists so it's pretty interesting so i looked at that for them but then what's interesting about j1s right is the two-year home residency requirement and what that means and i i'm sure everybody here knows it but you know, the purpose of the collab is to is to sort of educate so the, the two-year home residency requirement means at the end of that visa they have to go home for two years and it's really really hard to waive them um even marrying an american citizen just by itself is not enough the O-1, believe it or not, is. It's the only visa that you can say just by, by filing an O-1, you are not subject to the two-year home residency requirement. Not an L, not an H, not anything else, just an O. If you are married to an American, you could then have a waiver if there's hardship to that American, right? So you marry somebody and they're sick and the basic argument was make, if I have to go back to my country, 
um, this person's suffering from extreme anxiety and and has to see his or her doctor and um, it's going to create more anxiety and then you'd have the 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 psychiatrist or psychologist or, or clinic clinician or whatever, write a letter to explain how hard that would be um, uh, with uh, with that. Right. Um, so that the, so that was a J now. So the they, when you look at J's and and again, you guys may know this already, but just if you don't, um, there is a document that was produced in 2009 called a skills list. Right. And and you go to the skills list. We have a connection to that on our website or our, our platform. You go to the skills list and you look at what is the country and then um, what are the skills? So they have all the skills first. and They give them numbers. Uh, for example, legal services is number 24. So then it goes by the country and the country will list what skills are subject to the two year home residency requirement and which aren't right. And so I uh, went through the skills and I found that India for law and legal studies was a two year home residency requirement, but wasn't the business management. So the interesting thing about working on J's is J one issuing companies are companies, right? And they make money. And so like a company that makes money, unlike the government, um, is willing to talk to you and um, willing to talk to you and, uh, uh, and, and see what the, uh, and, and try to work through things, right? So you can send them resumes. So, so when we saw that, 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 that legal services was a two-year home residence requirement, we shifted to business management training. Right. And so we've done a lot of those. We've probably done more J's in that realm and many times as in lieu of H. Right. When the H cap hit, we, they want to keep this person. So what business management J's are all about is how do you operate a company? Right. So the question is, could you as a lawyer, because it has to be related to your degree, do a management training program to understand how to run a law firm? So you could go back there. Now, this particular law firm is well situated because they have an office in Bangalore, India. They have an office in San Francisco. So this person, um, after the end of the J, could make the argument, I can go back and, and manage that arm of the company or set up my own company that does the same thing. And what they do is they identify really talented Indian techies and they bring them over to the United States and they set them up bank accounts at Silicon Valley Bank. That was really interesting. And then they they help them raise money and then we do their visas, right? So we end up doing O1s and stuff like that for them or IEPs or L's or whatever, right? So it, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing. So the, so the J1 as an option is there. And so we have the J1 company looking at, yes, she's a lawyer. Yes, she has a law degree. She has both a law degree. It's a bachelor's degree. It's what they do in India and a lot of countries. And then an LLM that she got here at the University of California, um, because that's what you do. And if you get your LLM, then you sit for the bar, you pass the bar, you can become a lawyer, right? Didn't get picked up in the H and that's the deal. So that's sort of the, the analysis there. Um, Ben, what are some of your thoughts about what we just talked about as uh, as other visa options in lieu of H if they don't get picked up? No, that's you, you got to think outside the box. Right. So I just wanted to go back to Joy's point really quickly about, mm. you know, the recruiter not telling you in time, Joy, about the H-1B registration and all of that. You know, that's a tough sell, though. Right. I used to be Motorola's in-house immigration attorney and, you know, I was. There's recruiters and whatever they called it, the talent acquisition team. And there's, we had hundreds of recruiters, right? So it was this constant training and they're trying to fill hundreds of positions, right? So you gotta, you gotta teach the, you gotta teach the immigration element to it, right? When I started at Motorola, the big problem was, hey, how come we're not getting these talented foreign nationals? Because we're offering them more money, right? than other companies are offering them. Well, what are you telling them? Well, they're asking something about an HB1 or something. So see, that's when I realized our own recruiters didn't know about immigration, right? We're, we're getting beaten, not by the salary, but by the, the fact that the foreign national who is concerned about their future in the United States and not just a salary, you know, other companies have people who know, oh yeah, well, We'll do your H-1B. We'll make sure we'll do the registration on time and all of that. Whereas Motorola's recruiters are like, 
Paul? You know, what, what is that? What are they talking about? We're offering them a lot of money and they're not going with us. So I kind of get you, Joy. I, I know where it's coming from. But going to John's point, I mean, that's what Motorola and I think the bigger companies started to do, right? They started to go, well, we'll identify our top, top candidates that did not get picked in H-1B and we, if they're that talented or, you know, if the position is that high joy director, or whatever, we are willing to send them to Motorola India or Motorola China, wherever, right, for a year for them to be eligible for L1. So you just, these are the things that you have to do. And again, you know, like we talked about with Sarah and Joy, it's a cost, cost analysis and again, taxes and all those things. So there's so many, many factors, you know? So that was my thought on that, Joy. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Jo Joy, you have a, another input. Yeah, Ben, you're right. You know, making sure that talent acquisitions and the recruiters actually understand what is needed when it comes to hiring foreign nationals is key. And we're normally pretty good and on top of it, but we had, you know, we actually had a recruiter that was in the Ukraine recruiting for this particular job in the United States, which is kind of strange. Right. And he kept saying, it's not an issue. It's not an issue. U.S. immigration is easy. And I'm thinking, right. oh, no, never, you no. know absolutely nothing about U.S. immigration. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I would never say it's easy. Yeah, never. Well, mm -hmm. not only do you not say it's easy, it's it's impossible to, if you're not doing this every day, to understand mm -hmm. all the new So how do you mm -hmm. train recruiters, which are salespeople, right? Trying to recruit people to sell sales or yes, 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 we'll do whatever it takes. And what our job as attorneys is, well, wait a second, we can only do what we can do. And and uh, and many times we're, we're trying to do both of those things. We're trying to onboard a client. We're trying to come up with a solution. They can do that for them while um, it's, it's not always that easy. So uh, interesting. So thanks. Thanks for raising that uh, joy. Why don't we uh, to hear from uh, some of the others? Um, uh, Alex, what are you working on this week? Anything interesting you want to talk about? John, thanks for asking. As I said, you know, this week, Friday, this is almost over. I had a busy week at, uh, you know, things were going on at home with the baby. So I'm looking forward to my five strategy sessions, which left for today. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much all. Yeah, really. Okay. Well, but any any issues come across your desk that you thought were interesting, either that, that hey, that's cool, and here's the answer to just kind of educate the rest of us, or um, that you didn't know the answer to and would like to kind of throw it out and, and hear what all these uh, really smart lawyers think? This week, probably not, John. It was, I cannot recall for this week specifically. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why don't we move over to Yesh? How, how are you doing, Yesh? Hi guys, um, I'm doing well. The I believe, well, this week we had an interesting scenario where um, we're trying to see if there's, you know, USCIS is questioning PPP loans um, and that implication with, you know, uh, employers H-1B filing. So I don't, I haven't seen any talk about it. Um, and any I think of, that's a great one to throw out. Now, Sarah, you may have seen this, maybe, maybe, maybe not in your career, but um, Yesh and I talked about this. This is really interesting at a couple of different levels. So apparently, uh, PPP filings are public. Um, didn't know that, um, but we have a client um, that said that they had forty. Uh, seven employees and the significance of that number is that it's less than 50 right and so if they had had more than 50 uh, and more than 50 percent of them are h1bs which they are then they would have had to pay a substantially higher um, filing fee and go through more recruitment efforts uh, they'd have to you know prove their recruitment efforts uh, that they weren't cutting the jobs of americans so it's a big deal to not be over that number so the h1b question was we see that you said 47 on the on this H-1B uh, filing. However, your PPP records, which were not even from the same exact date, right, um, indicated 57, right? And so you need to pay us an additional, what, 3,000 something dollars. Uh, let's throw it out to the group. Has anybody else 
seen that issue in an H-1B yet? Sarah, have you seen it? I have not. No. Be scary, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the second question, right? I mean, so we we meant we went immediately into um, the visa acceptance is less important than exposing our client to fraud, right? So they say to the government, um, A, when it came for an immigration benefit, and B, when it went for a PPP benefit. Now, the first thing I said is when were they filed, right? And, and so they weren't filed on the same day. And so I think the answer is um, that our, our, you know, our employees fluctuate, right? And um, on the day we filed the H-1B, that was correct. And on the day we filed the PPP, that was correct, right? Now, the what is scary is two things. Um, one, are those right? We don't know. We'd have to ask our clients. Number two, do you, do you put your client in that position of affirming or denying or affirming anything, right? I mean, affirming anything uh, now that and most immigration attorneys are not criminal defense attorneys, right? And so the criminal defense attorney that could possibly, you know, take this to its logical end, being defending a fraud case, um, white collar, you know, crime of some sort, if that's what it ever went to, I don't I'm not saying it would or it is, but that's what you got to think. Um, would would say, counsel, why did you say that? You should have said nothing, right? Anything you say can and will be held against you is the answer, right? So um, we're thinking about that when we do it. Let's like let's not put a line in the sand that really says anything that could be hurt our client in the future. Number two, maybe those numbers were correct. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. Um, but do we have proof if they were? And two, do we want to share that proof with them, right? You know, in this instance, um, the client would much rather lose this particular case than get into a battle. And, and it raises the next question. Does USCIS CIS, take this response to an RFE and then send it over to, um, is it the SBA, Small Business Administration, another U.S. agency, and say it's come to our attention that these guys are telling you one thing and us another, you should look into it. I heard when I first started practicing law that IRS and USCIS would never share information. They didn't like each other. I have not heard that statement made in years, and I don't know that that's the case anymore. And with organizations like FDNS, um, which I don't think have existed the entirety of the 30 years I've practiced. I don't know when they started. I know they're a lot more active than now. Sort of is the referral agency, maybe for all agencies to say, hey, look at this. So maybe they don't have to send it to SBA. They send it to the fraud detection unit and they then determine whether or not there's something there and whether to investigate and do a site visit. Okay, so I want to throw that out to the crowd. I want to start with you, Sarah. What do you, what do you think about these things? Do I think the government shares? <laughs> wow. Um, on one hand, I see how that could be easy, but on the other hand, I don't know how they could possibly do that with how inefficient they are in so many other. <laughs> it would take somebody to have to really care, right? Yeah. Uh, to, to really uh, want to go get somebody. And really want to like get somebody, right? Mm -hmm. I get you know that's it. Well, and and yeah, that, I think that's the issue. But do you expose your client saying, yeah, you know these guys don't do their job very well, so we're just going to think they're not, and we're going to go ahead and do this, right? And I guess the question is, if you really need the case approved, you answer it, and yeah. if you want to keep from committing fraud, you don't answer it, and you're not the guy that puts your client behind bars, right? Because you, because you made them say something they shouldn't have said. No, absolutely not. Right. So if it's, yeah. but if it's true and they really want the guy and have documentation yeah. to right. prove yeah. kind of act, whatever we can, you know, and, and give it to them, uh, yep. give it. Yes. Yeah. So that's kind of what I've done in the past. Um, yep. And if it's fine, if we find out it's not true, which could be right, because these are different yeah departments filling out forms and who right. knows they're checking uh, you know, who cares it's not that big right. a deal say 57 or, or 47 for some individuals but um if it turns out it's false yeah i would probably just withdraw that petition 
And, well, and, I, and I think for the sake of this case, that's what they're going to do. Um, yeah. I think the beneficiary has moved on. And I think our job on this, this case is to make sure that um, we don't expose the company. Because yeah. if you withdraw, this is an interesting point. It's what I love about these collabs is because we don't get to, a, a, enough chance to talk to other attorneys on our day-to-day -day basis, right? But I think mm -hmm. that... Um, uh, the mere withdrawal of an H-1B, in my experience, will almost invariably trigger a fraud investigation of some sort, right? They're like, uh, you can't just say you're out, right? Now we're going to, now that, now we want to dig. So what, what we do as a process in our firm is we will always answer the RFE, right? So you answer the RFE, you say, this is not fraud. You prove it if you can prove it. You say, you, you take an affirmative statements, um, that we did not do anything wrong, or at least don't admit if there is something in that scenario um, in the RFE and then withdraw so that at least you've defended yourself and they'll say, you know what, these guys have lawyers. Um, we're going to move on and, um, and we're just going to deny this case and leave it at that as opposed to they've withdrawn it and they go. And, and I think clients for the most part, right, what I've what I've discovered is will withdraw, and then and and don't know that there's actually a policy memo out there that if you withdraw, we're going to hold it against you. And they think withdrawing is the way to do it. So I it's it's I've educated clients a number of times um, before and after the fact of the withdrawal is like that was a good idea or not a good idea. So so that's really great, uh, Sarah. Thank you for that um, for that analysis. That's that really shows in our in our job that there are no absolute answers. Um, sometimes it's yes. And sometimes it's no. And our clients, uh, uh, and I and I've seen this are really in the in the high volume staffing company. They rely and they think in absolutes, right? They think, well, my client, my attorney told me this is what we do when this happens, and it's never that, right? I mean, it's always like, well, in this instance, it's this, and in that instance, it's that. And one of the interesting things in developing an AI tool in law is the AI tool could think absolutely if you if it's not sophisticated enough right and that's why you need ai tools um should just be to enhance lawyers not replace them because we have to be making these judgment calls when it comes down to the scenario because what we just did is we gave a gut feeling based on our experience here's what i do in this circumstance with this set of facts knowing about these other things that that, that could go into that and that's what experience gives you right yeah. and in that and that, it's a really interesting uh concept and and we're going to be talking about ai and the law today and uh, and I'm, i might bring this anecdote up about how you could get a bunch of lawyers in the room 10 lawyers in a room and get 10 different opinions on mm -hmm. what you should do of course. Uh, and those things would all be nuanced, right yeah. So that that's cool. Thank you for that. Uh, that was, that was great stuff. I, I want to, uh, yes, that was, so can I go, go ahead? Yeah. Ben. I, I, so this is why I love this collab, right? We just talk about stuff that literally I've not thought about that for years, John, this whole do agencies, government agencies share information. You're right. I haven't heard that for like 20, you know, they don't share information. We haven't heard that for like 20 years, but I'm thinking, yeah. man, you go back, but we're talking nineties, right? Where, you know, they probably literally had to like pull the physical file and yeah. and mail right. it to the other department. And yeah, then you wonder right. now with the technology, though, are they more? Is it easier for them if they wanted to to, you know, email, whatever, download, share documents like that? So that's a really really fascinating question you know do yeah, they i didn't think of it from the the ease of transference of data yeah that there is, you go ease of transfer and, yeah so but this but the other thing i brought up was i i don't know maybe you guys know this and joe i know you get your hand up is the creation of fdns right i don't i don't remember when those guys came on board i know that we deal with them all the time now and um uh, you know and i know that either dol and, or USCIS can bring those guys in because both of those agencies are involved in the the adjudication of an H one B, right? So if the if the LCA is improper um, or the perm application or labor cert is improper, then DOL could say I see something and I'm going to send it to FDNS and then USCIS, of course, on the I one twenty nine. But they're sharing. But those those agencies do regularly work together. Right. I mean, they're they they're in concert. They've always been in concert. 
where I'd heard that they didn't was in IRS. But we do know that there, the taxes and immigration are uh, part and parcel, especially adjustment status, right? Um, but the, well, I was, and again, it's funny, Ben, you and I have been practicing about the same amount of time. It was regularly known that they didn't at some point, and I haven't heard that, and you've just, you know, validated that. I haven't heard that said in a long time, and yeah. maybe with the ease of transference and the fact that there's a fraud detection unit that maybe was invented for that exact reason that USCIS agents didn't like IRS agents and vice versa. They said, well, let's just create another entity. Let's make our government yeah. bigger and have those guys just deal with fraud no matter where it lives. And, and they may do two things. One, they are the recipients of these fraud requests, but they also may initiate them themselves. Like they could, they could look into something and then maybe ask the agency does this real? Or not? I don't know that. I don't know how those work, and I don't pretend to know that. But it, but it's fascinating when you do with investigations. You know what triggers it, right? And uh, and what I've noticed about these investigations, invariably, and especially when somebody's issues have been there, they still say um, this is a um, uh, what are the, what's, it's a, it's a really um, uh, nonchalant way of saying, uh, what they're doing, but they'll just say, um, this is a routine investigation, right? That, that it's a, it, it is a random investigation. And I think many times they're lying that they're not random at all. And I think when they say it's random, it gives the, um, the person they are investigating a sense of calm. So they'll talk, right? And what you have when you're dealing with, you know, H-1B petitioning companies is law-abiding citizens. These aren't criminals. They're not hardened up. They don't know to be quiet. They, they and, and they're respectful, right? So when a, when a government officer asks them questions, they, they feel it's rude if they don't answer them, right? So we've spent some time uh, educating our clients. If an, a, an investigator comes, um, tell them you have an attorney, get their card and say your attorney will be back in touch with you. And you can talk to them, but don't say anything substantive. Do not answer their questions about the heart of the matter, right? Be friendly, be nice, tell them you're going to cooperate if you want, but didn't say I'm a represented by counsel. And, and I like to use this, this analogy, right? I, I tell them, Every cop movie you ever watch, they tell you um, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you. And that if you have a right to an attorney and if you don't have an attorney, we'll provide one for you. Well, that's the law. And that law became law in 1965 with the Miranda case, the Supreme Court case that said that if they didn't say that, they couldn't use any of the evidence in trial, right, um, for a crime. But I guess why they don't read them Miranda rights when they're investigating them is number one, they're not a target of an investigation yet, whatever target might mean in that in that realm. That's we, I think they do that when like the FBI or SEC is investigating. It's not to that level. And and I think because of that, it's not a crime, even though fraud, if if that's what they're recording, could be a crime or is a crime at, at the highest level. So for whatever reason, they're not telling him that. And therefore, they're saying that I'm wondering if any of these admissions that may come out, if they do end up in fraud, would end up being tossed out um, on Miranda uh, 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 reasoning. So interesting thing. Anybody want to weigh in on on any of that discussion and take take it for a run? Joy, you have your hand up. I, I assume you can go wherever you want with it, actually. <laughs> so I was actually going to say the U.S. is probably like the farthest behind of all the first world countries when it comes to linking government systems for shared technology. Um, I, I know more recently we've had to be very conscious of you know, when employees are traveling on business when they already have a visa to make sure that we're reporting the proper compensation to, you know, the IRS. But I can tell you, years ago, the European governments, they literally had their internal revenue services and their immigration services linked very early on. And so if you had somebody who is traveling for business without even being on a visa, they would be able to identify how many individuals were coming into the country for a specific employer and literally start triggering IRS audits based off of the travel schedules of employees going to that employer. Wow. 
But Joy, that's the benefit of the EU, right? That's what, you know, Absolutely. it's more modern, you know, whatever, where we have these old bureaucratic infrastructures that are years and years behind. So I think that's just a, an incredible benefit of the European community, right? Well, it's uh, there's a couple of things at play here. Uh, one, Europeans historically have been much more autocratic than Americans. And you, you see all the movies, where are your papers, right? I mean, they are, because they're also different countries, right? So mm -hmm. you're, you're not going from Texas to Oklahoma where nobody has to stop you, but you're going from a, a, a country the size of Texas to a country the size of Oklahoma regularly, right? Through a train. And, and so they're used to um, checking uh, who people are and what they're at. In America, we have a massive influx of people uh, constantly that are undocumented. Uh, and we have a debate on whether or not we should even stop that, right? I mean, there are there are people that think it's inhumane to stop people from crossing the border, um, but definitely in the treatment of them. And uh, then there are others that say we don't want anybody crossing the border, no matter what, and we'll put them in cages, right? And and so we have this whole deal of freedom um, that fights back against government, also, which is, there's pros and cons to that, right? So the we 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 have concepts in this country of we should have less government. We should have less government oversight. We should let people do whatever they want to do. Uh, then we have others going, come on, we got to, we got to regulate this stuff. Um, and it makes sense. So I don't know that those other countries have that philosophical debate on how their government even works on these bureaucratic issues that we have here. And I think what it's, what it's done to us is left us with really bizarre bodies of law and almost all of our agencies regulations are just massive right it's definitely not limited to immigration tax right i mean the tax code's ridiculous and and so and we have agency decisions and this is going kind of goes to litigation that are done so informally right and and that's really one of the things that we're trying to fight with visas.ai is we think most immigration lawyers um allow as they would immigration to set the table on how do we look at this issue right and then they sort of structure it for us and then and then we you know argue facts and they want it that way because it's efficient what i think they've done at the initial structure is fine here's what the regulations say that's the deal yes they have policy memorandums they're the ones that should determine that they're the ones that are adjudicating it right but what what i find interesting especially in response to RFEs is that many times they will paraphrase the regulation and then leave words out or leave clauses out and then look at it in a really restrictive way and then they'll say okay now answer it and i think what most immigration attorneys do they go okay they're like they don't question the question right they just take the question and answer the question the best they can where immigration has already painted them into a corner and there's only one way out right that's that's what they do. They're right. And they they've have to become craftier and craftier about it. Um, I've seen that in the last number of years um, that the RFEs used to be pretty innocuous and then got really, really crafty in and creative in their ways of denying things. And they're doing it by starting with misapplication of the regulation. Right. Then ignoring their own policy, then citing um case law that's no longer even accurate or they're citing it wrong. One of the biggest examples of the wrong citation of a law is where they got crushed. I mean, Kazarian crushed them. I remember when it came down and I remember Cyrus Maida, who is one of the great thinkers mm -hmm. in immigration law. I used to love to read that guy's stuff. He probably still puts it out there, but Cyrus Maida was delighted and he'd always write this blog about Kazarian because what Kazarian was, was on the EB1 and it talked about, um, I think USCIS tried to deny the case on the fact that the um, the publication by the um, beneficiary, the foreign national, itself wasn't extraordinary. But the, the, but the plain language of the regulation is that you have to be published in an academic journal or scholarly journal, right? And they have it, right? That here, here's the publication. It's a scholarly journal meets the plain language of the law. They said it wasn't it wasn't extraordinary in itself. And so what Kazarian said in its holding, and this is interesting lawyers going back to law school, the difference between a holding and dicta, right? They used to, to hammer that with us, the holding of the case. We had to put the big H next to it and say, um, this mm -hmm. is the deal. The holding of the case was that 
immigration can't use regulations. Sarah, uh, uh, I'll come right to you. They, uh, they can't use regulations that are more restrictive than the plain language that's there. But in the dicta, they said that should be for a secondary analysis, um, which became now immigration's uh, knife. Okay, you got us on that, but now we can make up new reasons in the totality of the circumstances as a second wave of adjudication that don't even have regulations on how to deal with it, right? And that was right in the face of a Supreme Court case called Bulletini, right? And Bulletini basically said, if you get through the first three, it, the burden shifts to immigration to have to prove why you didn't do it. And they completely ignore that. And that's an example of immigration that's uh, structuring this thing to create denials. Okay, so Sarah, what is, uh, you've raised your hand. What, how would you like to weigh in? Yeah, exactly. So um, that's really on point. I think I mentioned maybe before you joined, but I just actually filed my first complaint on an EB1A mm -hmm. final merits. So talking about Kazarian, I've really been like up to my eyeballs in this because it's it's so unfair, right? It yeah. meets person in their denial decision. They say, yeah, he meets all the criteria. And in their denial, they don't even say, you know, that, oh, his, the journals aren't good enough. They just say, oh, it's common. You know, yeah. so we accept that. It's like, I don't even know what else to give you, USAF, and they're not telling us, but they're mm -hmm. able to deny that using this discretionary Kazarian final merits. So I know it's a long shot. The client knows it's a long shot. Tended to defer to the agencies. But I think it's worth the fight. I hope so, anyway. Um, yeah, well, I'm really, I'm really glad you did that because I sued my, I've sued USCIS twice, actually three if you count the one that just happened yesterday. But, um, but that was really through the EEOC. But I've, I've filed two uh, in my, in my career, and I've done a lot of litigation against the government. Right, I have a 24 year litigation against the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But um, I filed my first one and won it. Um, really the last month or so on an EB1. And I, I what I wanted to do is test our brief, right? And and um, and and I, we, we can talk, I, I, it's great to talk about it here, but I'm glad to talk about it with you more um, on what we did and how it happened because that any of that is helpful, I think. So yeah. I used our brief where I made the argument that expert testimony is, um, is evidence, right? That's what the uh, beast, Beast, I think it's Beastman, Beastwick, I'm sorry, Beastman um, uh, Supreme Court case says, right, where they, it was a totally different body of law, but the, the having an expert evaluate it is evidence. And again, immigration doesn't have experts. So our denial on an EB1, they gave them all four criteria, right? They then did a totality of the circumstances argument. And what they did is they went back and instead of what I think totality of circumstances means is you look at all of it, right? And, and you say, okay, you know, if you look at all of it, this is impressive or it's not impressive, right? But what they did is they went back and siloed each of the criteria again and made up a new, more restrictive analysis on top of the analysis that they had met. And one of them was, well, we see that they that he's a member of two associations, but just being in two is not extraordinary, which to me sounds exactly like a violation of Kazarian, right? But they said because it's totality of the circumstances, they can then talk about the number of them as if that matters, right? And I'm my argument was they have it's arbitrary and capricious to make up regulations, right? And then it was arbitrary and capricious not to evaluate the experts' analysis of this. They just pretended it wasn't there. And why I'm I was really proud of this is because the, I wrote all that in our initial petition, and then I re, I, I referenced it again in our RFE. So when I filed the lawsuit, I could go back to the petition as evidence. We we told them not once but twice about the expert, and they still ignored it, right? And so here's what they did, Sarah. They um they they um they kind of played with us on service, right? They they didn't accept service this one way, and they finally did. So that delayed it, and the government gets sixty days to answer. So that's a long time. And then they um they asked for a stay. Um, to reopen it, and and I and 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 they did it in a weird way. And I said, 
well, okay, because they can do that. But I already knew in San Francisco they had reopened it and tried to rationalize their argument, and they really got slammed by the court in the case I was sort of watching um, as a as a pattern for mine. And then, um, but I'm like, you know, I, I really can't say no to that. So they did it, and they then they told me via email that they were going to issue a notice of intent to deny. And I'm like, uh, and I asked around, I'm like, how do you do a notice of intent to deny after you've already denied? Right. That doesn't really make sense. But the funny thing is they got up to the end of their stay and then they didn't um, they didn't um, they didn't meet the, the deadline. Right. So then they asked me, can we extend the 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 the, the, um, the stay? Now, they've already told me now that they're going to do a notice of intent to deny. So I actually had nothing to lose to say no. And then you know what they did? Prove the case. <laughs> So they approved it before they even answered it, right? So hmm. I know we don't have a ton of time left, um, but um, or if any, but tell me what? Are, where are you in the stage? Have have you filed? Have they responded? And and what are you? What's next? John, I filed this morning. <laughs> hey, that's when that's fantastic. Okay, so yeah. look, what I just told you is my experience, and I think uh, it'll be interesting. I'm glad to talk to you as it goes along. Yeah. Um, if you want to just bounce it off of me, yeah. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. I'd love to do it. And matter of fact, I am trying to build out and I think it'll be neat because we're, we're the same, right? We're, we are case processors. We're not litigators against USCIS, but I yeah. think, I think we should be right. And I think we all should be, and I don't think it should be limited to one or two guys that don't have enough time to do that, that are so busy. They can't call you back. And that's what my experience was, right? I tried to refer this case to another attorney, a couple of them, and they're just too busy. And so I just did it. And um, so what I'm going to build into visas.ai is a litigation component of a how to file a petition, right? And uh, a how to file service. And then what I want to do is, uh, you know, uh, models for motions for summary judgment. And I think that um, that most of them will go that far. And I think what we what will be asked by our clients, because our clients are used to not paying for very much, right? And our clients are also not used to paying by the hour. So I think what they're doing in the litigation component in immigration is getting attorneys to componentize it. Like I will, through filing a complaint, I'll charge you this, right? And then if they, if we go to discovery, that's a different animal, but we can put a, we could put a, a window on it. Right. But I don't think discovery is in most of them. I think, you know what the law is. And if they say no, you file a motion for summary judgment. And then say, if we file a motion for summary judgment, that can be X. If they respond, that's another thing. And then you can even do it by, by Ben. So I'm thinking of something like that. What are, what are your thoughts on that from a model, um, uh, both on how attorneys would deal with clients and, and whether or not a tool like that would be helpful? For me, I think that would be helpful. There's a ton of research. I'm not a litigator, so it was just a lot <laughs> right? of time that I didn't necessarily bill for, which is okay because I find it super interesting and it's been really yeah. fun. Um, and I mean, Hopefully everything, I, I think it's all, I checked all the boxes and it was done properly. Mm. Um, but yeah, you kind of have this doubt if it's not something you do every day. Um, 100%. That, that's yeah. where I was. I, that's where I was. And I look, I donated it. I, I did the whole thing for free <laughs> to win it. So I could use my, I wanted to try, I want to get my brief to work. Right. I wanted to see, did yeah. I do it right? And what would have really been even cooler is if I got to do the motion for summary judgment and I got to say it was in the record and the judge did that and a judge gave me a, a win so that I could get EIJA legal fees. <laughs> but, but in any case, we got the client, the green card and, and uh, that was that was the ultimate thing. But yeah, I'm with you on that. And I think if we created this tool, not only could you have the tool that would help you that it would answer some of those questions going in. Right. Like uh, what what do I have to do for uh, service? And then I have links to to how to do service. And then I think a key thing would make sure that you have local counsel. Right. And um, in, in that and and how do you package it up to send it to local council? What do you talk to local council? So I think if we could do something like that, I think we could get more people to litigate against USCIS, which I think would be better for all of us. Yes. Very cool.